welcome back to our next lesson on uh, the doctrine of Christ and we are going to look at lesson number two the humiliation of Christ so what did Jesus do between his birth and death the life of Jesus on earth that is the theme of this lesson so in the introduction on page 12 the purpose of this lesson is to examine the work of Jesus Christ from his birth until his ascension noting his active and passive obedience his humiliation and the significance of his work particularly as it relates to justification so Jesus lived and died and rose for our justification and sanctification and is coming for our glorification so by now you will know these themes and these topics and the meaning of the word justification sanctification and glorification so justification is what we receive we are justified when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior it is that moment we are justified before God means we will not accept the punishment that is due to us so we are justified because of the work of Jesus Christ sanctification is a process from the time we accept Christ until the time we die that process of becoming like Christ and glorification is what we will receive one day when we are before God and we are glorified after we've received our rewards in heaven here is beautifully explained justification is the act of God's free grace by which he pardon all our sins and accept us as righteous in his sight he does so because he counts the righteousness of Christ as ours justification is received by faith alone justification fully depends on the finished work of Jesus Christ very important that we understand this and explain it to our people Jesus lived in active obedience for our justification so two main themes active obedience and passive obedience very important when God speaks to us is instant obedience delayed obedience is also disobedience so when God gives you an command if we reveal something to you we must respond to God and not be like Jonah delayed our obedience sometimes it's a process takes time for us to fully obey but immediately respond to the voice of God honoring him as our Lord and Savior so active obedience we will explain that firstly so Jesus lived 33 years under the law without sin he was born under the law of Moses this means Jesus was born into the Jewish race under the covenant which God made with Abram which was further developed through Moses and David and the prophets who describes its blessings and cursed as they applied to the nation Israel the law is summary required that men love the Lord with all your heart all your mind and all your soul and that you love your neighbor as yourself it requires that they be holy because God is holy holy means to be set apart for God's purpose yeah the example of holiness is seen in the utensil that was used in the tabernacle they were dedicated for the unique and sole purpose of being used as instruments to worship God so two words for sin in the New Testament is transgression missing the mark like an arrow falling from its target so Jesus actively lived in perfect obedience he always did the will of the Father in heaven he was without sin Christ never did an act of sin Christ never knew sin and had an evil thought he lived in active 
sinless life as a man. He was righteous, that is, he was in right standing with God before because of active internal external obedience to keep the law with all his heart, with all his mind, with all his soul and strength. Jesus fulfilled the Lord. The Father was well pleased with the active obedience. The voice out of heaven came and said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Number B, the active obedience of Jesus included him fulfilling the duties of Christ to be God's anointed prophet, priest and king. As a man, Jesus fulfilled these three major leadership offices. So what are they? Prophet, priest and king. Last week we talked about how Jesus became a priest. So now let us continue with those topic prophet, priest and king. The first one is a prophet, is somebody who speaks God's message to man. Jesus is the great prophet of which Deuteronomy prophesied. Moses, after his death, God said, I will send you a great prophet like Moses. So a prophet is somebody who is called by God in the Old Testament to proclaim God's message. Today in the New Testament we have the office of a prophet. Somebody who proclaims God's message. But we can all be prophets in the sense that we can all proclaim God's message. Paul said in Corinthians, I want you all to prophesy, meaning talking God's word to people. So there's the office of the prophet, which is one of the fivefold ministries in the church. Remember, it's not a title. In the Old Testament, people were called a prophet, but in the New Testament, it's not a title or a position. It is an office. It's a responsibility. It's a gift that God has given some people to be prophets, in the sense of they speak God's word to the people. We will explain that more in detail in the next course on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus claimed to be a prophet in Mark 6 verse 4 and other recognize him as a prophet in these those verses. So Jesus prayer also in John 17. It's very a significant prayer. He said, I have given them the words that you have given me. So God the Father gave Jesus the Son words which he has given them, the message. Jesus is not only the living message, he's also giving us the written message, the living word of God, the Logos, and then the spoken word of God, the Rema. And today we have the Bible which contains the words of God, the living fully inspired scriptures breathed in by God. Jesus was a foreteller. He predicted certain events like his death, his resurrection to his disciples and also his ascension. Christ was a foreteller, a preacher. He explains and applied the word of God. He instructed, he instructed men in the will of God. Christ revealed God. Unlike the other prophets, Christ's life and person revealed God in addition to his message. Christ was God made flesh. The visible likeness of the invisible God. As priest, so priest as office, somebody who represent people before God and sometimes even God to the people. So the prophet speaks from God to the people and the priest mainly represent people before God and in the old covenant he's the one who brings sacrifices. He sacrifices in order that man can approach God and receive forgiveness. So Jesus Christ is the great high priest. Hebrews 5 and 7. So according to the epistle Hebrews he was qualified for the office he was appointed by God. His priesthood was a higher order than that of Aaron. And Aaron had suspended the patriarchal system. All functions of the priesthood were performed by Christ. His priesthood was eternal, indicating its superiority and finality. 
As a high priest, he is both the one who offers the sacrifice and the sacrifice offered to sin. So, through his active obedience, the incarnate God-man can sympathize with us in our sufferings and temptations because he himself who was tempted and therefore he can intercede actively for us. So he's a mediator. One mediator between God and man and man and this is the man Jesus Christ. He is the perfect mediator. A mediator represents both parties in need of reconciliation. A mediator must be both God and man or he does not qualify for the mediatorial office. King, he was born a king. He was the only person who ever was born a king. Mostly people are born a prince. If your father is the king, your mother is the queen, you are born a prince. But Jesus was born a king. One of the primary reasons for the incarnations was the fulfillment of the earthly purpose of God in the divinic covenant. The fact that Jesus was born a king is the proof of his messianic ship and his divinity. God the king, when he entered into man, he had the right to rule. So he entered the moment that baby was born. He was born king of kings and lord of lords. The Old Testament had predicted the coming of a king who would fulfill the promise of God to David. Jesus was the child born who would rule the kingdom given him by God. The major theme of Matthew the gospel is set forth Jesus Christ as king. Jesus started his ministry and said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. A kingdom without a king is not a kingdom. Jesus became oh, Jesus came and he pronounced the kingdom of God because he is the king. So when Jesus entered into the Jerusalem, he was the triumphant king and Jesus was crucified of his ascension that he was king and the Jews rejected him. When Jesus was crucified, above his cross was the words, Jesus, the king of the Jews. King Jesus over a kingdom that is not of this world. Jesus told Herod, who heard him before he condemned him, said, My kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my followers would have fought. Christ is still king today as he rules as king in our hearts of all those who acknowledge him as Lord, Savior and Messiah. So Jesus lived in active obedience for our justification. Active obedience. His perfect obedience made him the spotless Lamb of God, the sacrif righteous sacrifice for sins. His perfect righteousness, life as a prophet, a priest and a king was given for our justification. And his righteousness is imputed to us. We are counted righteous by faith, even as Abram was. Imputed, it was put into us. Active obedience. Now let us look at Passive obedience. By passive obedience we mean Jesus did not resist the will of God in his suffering. Isaiah 53 is the beautiful verse which says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb is led to the slaughter, and a sheep that before his shearers is silent. So, he opened not his mouth. So Jesus in agony and excruciation, suffering and death, passively without resistance, telling the Father, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. We all know the wages of sin is death, and the soul that sins shall surely die. So but Jesus never sinned, he was righteous. So by God's covenant standard, Jesus was promised life, yet he changed his life for our life. So that brings us to the question, for whom did Jesus die? 
Jesus died for all those the Father had given him. Beautiful that way. He died on page 15. He died for those who had been blessed and chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. For those he had predestined for adoption through Jesus Christ. To the praise of God the Father and Christ. He died for all those the Father had given him in charge and did not lose one of them. Number three, Christ didn't simply make salvation possibly. He actually saves people. So he did not come and he said, here is salvation. He made it possible for us. Actively involved. Remember when we looked at the Trinity in the previous course. Peter said, you have been chosen by God before the foundation of the world. Sanctified through the Holy Spirit. Justified through the blood of Christ. So the triune God, the Trinity, is actively involved in our salvation. So although the work of Christ is sufficient to save the whole world, only those who are elected are saved. So what does that mean? It means only those who choose salvation. It is given for all of us. God did not want anyone to be lost, but that everyone will be saved. For so God loved the world that he sent his only son. But we know not everybody except him. So even though salvation is possible for everybody, not everybody wants to choose to accept it. And the moment you choose Christ, you are elected. That is one of the mysteries which the church are so much in confusion because intellectually we cannot understand this mystery. And it is hard for us to accept that there will be people in hell one day. People who have chosen not to accept the Savior. But by God's grace we have chosen and therefore we are the elected. Because we chose Christ and Christ is God's elected one. He is the only one the Father approved. Christ was chosen. He is the elected one chosen for us by God the Father. His offering for sin is accepted. So the moment we choose Him, we are counted among the elect. That is one of the mysteries of the all-knowingness of God. God knows who will be saved. Before the foundation of the world, He knows who would have chosen. Yet, we can still choose Him. But He knows we will choose Him. That's a mystery, my friend, and I pray that God will reveal that to you and you will not get confused. So the biblical term of the present benefit of Jesus' obedience. So here are some themes and terms we want to look at. The first one is a ransom. So Jesus' obedience was a ransom which justified his sheep. So a ransom is a pride Pay a price paid to set captives free. Because of Adam's sin, we are each born into a life of enslavement into sin, into the kingdom of darkness. We are captives to the law, under the power of sin, causing us to do what we do not want to do and preventing us to do what we want to do. Romans 7, Jesus came and gave a perfect life as a ransom to set his sheep free through his active passive obedience mark chapter 10 verse 45 said for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many he paid and the price was his life the ransom was paid to god who has sold us into slavery because of our covenantal disobedience the ransom of Jesus' perfect righteous life was paid to buy us out of slavery to set his sheep free. The ransom do not buy the option or possibility of freedom. A ransom result in actual freedom for what was paid. For freedom Christ has set us free. We must no longer be slaves of sin or chains or 
chains that bounds us living in disobedience willfully choosing to live a life of addiction struggling with behavioral issues struggling with things like anger and uh, compulsive behavior negativity depression no we are set free break those chains in your life don't let your life be dominated by them when Christ paid the sinner's penalty for sin his righteous life was credited to their account imputed as if the sinner if it was the sinner so when God took upon the justified sinner he counts Jesus righteousness as the sinners we have a righteousness that is not our own but that of Jesus counted as ours by faith that's beautiful justification the the West Assembly's confession of faith justification is the act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepted us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone that is ransom you pay a ransom to set a prisoner free or when somebody gets kidnapped you have to pay a ransom we are slaves so we are set free the next one is redeemed redeemed by his life and death Jesus redeemed his people so to be redeemed is to be brought back is to be set free as promised Moses that he would redeem his people the curse of the law was suffering captivity and death but Ephesians 1 verse 7 says in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of his grace redemption and forgiveness go hand in hand we are redeemed ransom is the price redemption is the result isn't that beautiful ransom is the price redemption is the result because Christ paid the ransom we are redeemed we are set free when Jesus died his last words was testalesta it means it is finished it is paid in full the debt has been settled so in the old days when you are in debt and they would come and take your home and your property and it will belong to the debt master or to something like the bank and the moment you sit you pay all your debt they would take a sign on a piece of paper which they would use those days and they would write on it Tetelesta and they would put it on your house mean paid in full your debt has been paid and the price has been accepted so our sin the punishment for our sin have been paid it has been settled he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light we have been set free from sin from the power and the penalty of sin one day from the presence of sin and its effects Ephesians 1 verse 7 we have redemption through his blood next one is atonement and immediately we think of the day of atonement once a year on Yom Kippur the high priest would enter into the most holy place and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people and make atonement which will last until next year then it has to be done again so atonement means by which two parties are reconciled in the Old Testament the priest acted as a mediator to offer sacrifices and offerings namely the Passover lamb then they had a scapegoat the bull the blood of bulls and goats birds and more the blood of sacrifice symbolized the penalty of sin being paid the scapegoat that was released symbolized Israel's sin being removed 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 says Christ died for our sins we mean that he was a substitute for our sin Christ not only died for our sins 
but he substituted for the sinners who committed those sins. He substituted himself for the people who were under the curse of sin. Romans 5 verse 8 But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isaiah 53, that remarkable chapter, in verse 5 we read, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. We are all like sheep that have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What a chapter! So the Bible indicates that at the death of Jesus, the penal, the judicial satisfaction by substitution. The Son of Man paid the price. His righteous lifeblood was the payment to satisfy the penalty of sin. Romans 8 verse 32. He did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Then the next word is quite a Tongue twister, propitiation, which Jesus accomplished propitiation for his people. So propitiation is to remove the personal wrath, the feeling of anger and judicial requirements for reconciliation. It is the satisfaction of wrath and justice. God is angry with the wicked every day. Joshua, Psalms, and Nehemiah. But the promise of God through the prophet Jeremiah said, God fulfilled, God has promised his faithful people he would not be angry with them if they acknowledged their guilt. Christ was the only one who could stand before the righteous God because Christ was not selfless nor was he, or he was not faithless nor was he sinful. He is perfect and holy. He stood in our place and absorbed the anger of God directed against sinners. Because God is just, all sin must be appropriated. You can either appropriate for your own sin in just eternal punishment, or you can receive the appropriation of Christ through faith. That's the only two choices we have. Either you pay for your own sin through eternal punishment or you accept that Christ payment for you. He made the full price. He paid it in full. And his payment was accepted. Christ's death satisfied the holy and righteous demands of God against sin and removed the wrath. God was God is not angry with those for whom Christ substituted his life. He may be grieved by our continual practice of a particular sin, but is not angry with us. His anger is for the wicked, is justicial, his grief is with the believer, is loving. So here's a good illustration to demonstrate this. It's a car accident. The guilty car uh, the guilty car driver is responsible for the cost of the accident. For the car to be repaired, the bill must be paid. The victim may choose to forgive, but if they do, they must bear the cost for the repair. Someone must pay. That is appropriation. What makes the gospel so amazing is that God's appropriation, his son Jesus, even though he's innocent, therefore, Paul says that God is both just and the justifier of those who believe him. So the last topic or theme is adoption. Jesus secured our adoption. We have become firstborn sons of Jesus. Jesus called his followers friends 
even though they are unworthy servants. So adoption is the legal means by which a person who is not natural son gains the same status as the natural son. A natural son has the family name, relationship, intimacy with daddy, provision, protection of the father and inheritance as well as suffering and glory for the father's family. Adoption grants the son who is not naturally born all the rights and privileges of being born. So we are not natural sons of God. We are instead natural children of wrath. Or as Jesus called it, we are children of Satan our father. But the moment we choose Christ, we move from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Jesus told the Pharisees, If God were your father, you would have loved me. You are of your father the devil, and you, your will is to do the, your father's desires. On another occasion he said, Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, sister and mother. These remarks clearly assume that covenant breakers are not by nature God's son. All men are born as covenant breakers. So the good news is that believers are adopted by God. As firstborn sons, both men and women, we are given access to the whole kingdom as co-heirs. We are not only accepted into the son, or into the family of God, but with Christ. Christ shared his inheritance with us. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 says, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that has imperishable, undefiled and undefading, kept in heaven for us who are by God's power being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. So in conclusion my friends, active obedience is the law keeper, is the prophet, is the king, is the priest. Passive obedience is suffering and crucifixion and the benefits Ransom, redemption, atonement, appropriation, and adoption. So, in conclusion, go through the lesson reviews in your class for the remaining of this class. God bless you.